planning the joint action was a joint process, like, like the work in the joint action has been a joint process. And uh, maybe I should remind those who are not so familiar with the joint action that uh, there are actually, ah, oh, no, it's working, three core work packages um, uh, that are being taken forward. And uh, the topics of today are just drawn from one of the work packages. What I was planning to do uh, here was to, to tell you a little bit about the background on this particular work package and um, describe very briefly the Delphi method that uh, was already um, mentioned that we have been using and then walk you through the uh, results. And I will... Oh. That goes in the wrong direction. This was what I was aiming at because this illustrates our starting point. The starting point for this work package was that guidelines for limiting drinking in order to reduce risks of harm from alcohol are given in most EU countries. But there is little variation in the level that has been defined as low risk. And, and that may confuse consumers and may reduce the potential for e effects of, of risk communication. And uh, this information that you cannot be read, but this um, is an example of the background work we did. This information was collected by the Italian Institute as background work for the joint action, because our working methods consisted on, on papers to summarize the scientific basis and, and surveys to update information on the current situation regarding the uh, low risk definitions and practices related to communicating them. Then we carried out two separate Delphi surveys to identify points of convergence and potential for consensus among experts in public health. One of the Delphi surveys was uh, uh, around issues related to low-risk drinking guidelines per se, and the other one was focused on guidelines for reducing alcohol-related risks uh, among young people. And the, present, the results of that one will be presented later. And then we organized meetings for exchange between experts, like we are doing today, and we will continue doing that in the future as well. Um, no, I just, yeah, here. This is very briefly some information about, about uh, how we are organized and who is involved in this work package. So this work package is led by the Finnish Institute for Health and Welfare and the Italian Instituto Superiore di Sanità. And we have uh, participants from altogether 34 partner organizations that are based in 24 countries. And here is some information about the um, experts participating in the Delphi survey. The Delphi process, very briefly, consists of a survey of expert views, and the survey is carried out in two or more rounds, with the results fed back to the respondents in between, in case they want to revise their views and, and arguments. And the um, surveys are carried out anonymously, to minimize the effect of speaker status and group dynamics. Normally, this process leads to some degree of consensus, but it also helps to identify topics on which positions differ. In this uh, Delphi survey that I'm going to talk you about, we had uh, 51 experts participating based in 27 countries. They had a very strong expertise in um, the alcohol field, but also considerable input from the public health field. And as you can see from the graph, which is based on self-classification, there were people who placed themselves in both expert groups. And uh, here are listed the main topics or themes that were addressed. And uh, I will walk you through the results. I will start with purposes of drinking guidelines, and then I will briefly present some methodological issues, and also briefly some points relating to communication to the public. And then I'll present the experts' views regarding the labeling of alcoholic beverages, and then finally come back to the key question, how to deal with the variation in, in drinking guidelines today. Here 
you have um, the answer to the key question, is there support among the experts for using low-risk drinking guidelines as a public health measure? Yes, there is. There is strong uh, support. There was no shift in positions between the, the survey rounds. There are minimal differences which may be due to slight changes of opinion or changes in willingness, willingness to take a stand or to panelist dropout. Because this survey was carried out so that uh, the respondents could skip any question they felt was outside their field of expertise or they felt uncomfortable answering. Um, key questions such as these were repeated in the two rounds to, to identify if there are really shifts in the positions or not. Uh, here is just an example that was already actually presented by Kit about having two um, uh, kind of guidelines, guideline for low risk and guideline for high risk, like the Danish uh, Health Authority plus the binge drinking avoidance guideline. So I was just, um, just um, taking this example because the Danish uh, example was presented in one of the previous uh, expert meetings organized for the Joint Action RARA. And uh, because there still, I think, was some confusion among the experts participating in the survey about when and uh, where we were talking about high risk or, or low risk. This slide shows the experts' um, understanding of the rationale for communicating low-risk drinking guidelines. So based on the results of the Delphi survey, the main justification is that consumers have the right to be informed about risks related to alcohol consumption. And uh, the experts also seem to uh, support the view that the core message is about risk rather than safety. And uh, there was a widely shared view that guidelines are needed separately concerning drinking over longer periods of time and drinking on a single occasion. And here is an attempt to summarize the, the difference of the um, purposes or effects that can be expected from these different types of uh, guidelines. So the primary purpose of low-risk guidelines is to inform rather than immediately change drinking patterns and not, not just inform alcohol consumers but also others uh, for whatever re reason they are not consumers. Whereas the um, high-risk drinking guidelines would be mainly directed to at-risk drinkers and, and contribute to encouraging them to reduce the amounts they are consuming. The single occasion guidelines would mainly be, be um, directed to help prevent um, uh, um, the risk of accidents and, and injuries due to intoxication. But all these different types of guidelines may have the potential to draw all alcohol consumers' attention to the risks that may be involved in their drinking habits. And that, in the long term, may contribute to shifting a little bit drinking patterns. So this is in a way deduced from um, the results of the Delphi survey, not something that was presented to the experts. And this slide refers to what Pia was talking about, that uh, normally the guidelines uh, regarding low-risk drinking are different for women and for men. And uh, this is also information gathered by the ISS, but you will not be able to read it. But in general, the, the, in Europe, the, there are different guidelines. And the typical justification is that women are more vulnerable to the effects of alcohol, mainly because of they reach a given blood alcohol concentration with a smaller amount of alcohol than men. That is normally given as the reason. So the, the um, Delphi survey Respondents, oh, this is an, actually an aside. This was uh, also mentioned by Pia and, uh, and by Peter as well, that there seems to be a move away starting uh, from, from gender-specific drinking guidelines to, to um, unified guidelines, both in Australia and the United Kingdom. That is where, where the, the 
issue is moving. But the um, experts in the Delphi panel were asked a direct question about whether they would support separate guidelines for women and men or or a single guideline. And it seems that the clear majority thought that low-risk drinking guidelines should be uh, should be uh, separately uh, specified for women and men, mainly because of physical and biological differences. A few did think that the same low-risk consumption might be justified, irrespective of gender. The arguments to back up that were that alcohol is harmful for humans, regardless of gender, that it would be easier to communicate a single guideline to the population, and that women are less prone to risky behavior than men. Um, actually, it seems that one in four would consider the use of same guideline uh, possible or else are undecided on this issue. Uh, there was also a question about the need for age-specific guidelines. This will be addressed in thoroughly in the presentation in the afternoon based on the other Delphi survey. Uh, the other Delphi survey was targeted to people who are experts on young people issues and this uh, Delphi survey was more with people who are generalists, not necessarily young people experts. But the, among this panel there is generally a lack of support for specifying low-risk drinking guidelines for young people under 18 years. A majority agreed that for young people any consumption of alcohol intense risk and the message should be that under 18 should not drink at all. Along with this um, area of consensus, there is an area where their views diverged. There is, on the one hand, um, support for what could be called a cautious stance, that is providing guidelines also for young adults above 18, and almost equal support for providing for harm reduction approach uh, as regards under 18s since a large part would be drinking anyway to provide them with some advice to reduce drinks risks, at least in countries where the legal minimum age is 16. Um, is there need for specific drinking guidelines for old, older people? The uh, reply from the panel was that yes, there was broad agreement that some sort of guidance for uh, older people would be in place. There was a group of almost equal size that called for clear guidelines on how many drinks on average young people, old people would be um, um, able to take without increased risk. Or another group of equal size who preferred a general statement about greater vulnerability, possibly also highlighting specific risks such as interaction with um, medications or comorbidities or risk of accidents. And this uh, slide is about the methodological issues. I will not go into the methodology here, but just very briefly mention that although there was uh, wide support for the use of low-risk drinking guidelines, there were also reservations and lack of support and even objections and the main reason behind these doubts seemed to be neither the uh, scientific basis for low-risk drinking guidelines or doubts as to their effectiveness. There was, however, a widely shared view that further research, further research may increase understanding of confounders and the relationship between alcohol consumption and health conditions, but the main body of science in this area is likely to remain valid. Um, areas that might deserve further attention is knowledge of causality and risks relating to alcohol, the reliability and validity of self-reports of alcohol consumption, and also further research would be needed on heavy drinking patterns and the risk of alcohol related to mortality and morbidity. And also there is a call for quantifying harms to others but more as a useful background for formulating low-risk guidelines than as feeding in directly into intake guidelines. Um, here's a summary of some of the 
communication aspects, because many of the doubts concerning the use of drinking guidelines seem to have more to do with communication to the public and professionals than with the scientific basis. On the other hand, there were some commentators who thought that uh, well-designed communication could uh, help uh, prevent some counterproductive interpretations and effects. And um, here is a summary of uh, suggestions coming from the expert panel on, on points that would be important to highlight in communication to the public. First, that low risk drinking does not mean no risk, and that, for instance, occasional heavy drinking and daily drinking are both potentially harmful drinking patterns. Then there are at risk groups or high risk situations that should uh, be um, highlighted, call, calling that call for caution. For instance, use of medication or mental health problems. Then uh, situations where the safest option is not to drink at all, quite predictable, pregnancy, driving when at work, and particular harms to highlight, in, for instance, at the top, where increased risk of cancer and risk of adverse effects on the family. As regards the positive effects of alcohol, the views were divided, whether it would be better not to include any messages about positive effects in low-risk communication, or whether uh, messages should be there to correct misconceptions. The next slide was another aside, and that was about the planning pregnancy issue, but that was already touched upon by Peter, so this just serves to move us to the next topic, which is the panelists' view on the labeling of alcoholic beverages. There were several questions about what kind of information should, health-related information should be there on alcoholic beverage labels. And um, there was a um, wide call for the calorie content to be there and a general view that consumers should have full information on alcoholic beverages. Um, and then, um, uh, quite spontaneously in comments, many experts highlighted that there should be uh, warnings about potential um, harm, health risks. Quite predictable also here, the pregnancy and drink driving, but also um, mixing alcohol with medications, vulnerability of minors and effects on the brain and so forth. So this makes a nice candidate list for rotating information texts. And in response to a direct question, would it be useful from a public health perspective if warning messages about health or safety risks were required across the European Union on alcoholic beverage packages or on alcohol advertisements? The um, res response was mostly yes, wide support. And um, the main argumentation behind that was that obtaining information is the consumer's right and providing information about the risks of alcohol would make for coherent public health policy related to smoking um, as well. And uh, here are examples of uh, variation in the definition of standard risk, which is called the unit in the UK. This is also just to illustrate that there is a lot of variation. But the experts were asked whether it would be, make sense to, to move towards a common definition of a standard drink. And uh, yes, there was support for that, but justified doubts as to the feasibility of a common definition, mainly because giving up established national definitions would be too much trouble, and no guarantee that the common definition would be better understood or more usable than the national one. Um, there were two suggestions for alternative approaches. One, to drop the scientific precision and just talk about drinks. That would evidently be understood differently in different countries and by different people. Or to go for grams. Actually, the idea of using milliliters, like Peter did in his presentation, did not come up at all. But in fact, there was a lot of support for the idea of indicating grams pure alcohol in a package, on the label of an alcoholic beverage package. And uh, then I'm almost at the end. Um, 
Would it be uh, desirable for European public health bodies to agree on a common concept of low-risk drinking? And uh, most of the experts in this panel thought that yes, it, it would be desirable. So it would be desirable to move away a little bit from the current variation in guidelines. Um, the main challenges there seem to be the existence of the established national definitions and differences in drinking culture. A change in national guidelines will not be perhaps acceptable politically or among the population. There were words of caution from the experts, including that agreeing on a common definition would be a long-term process. But on the other hand, somebody suggested that an initiative to agree on a common definition would in any case stimulate scientific discussion about the nature of alcohol-related harm. How then to proceed? As replies to questions presented to the experts, it, it seemed that one way to move forward would be um, to designate a task group to review available evidence, including results of quantitative risk modeling, and to seek consensus on conclusions and recommendations. In answers to the question which body in Europe could have or give mandate to set up such a task group, the WHO was mentioned the most often, followed by the European Union, either jointly with the WHO or a single actor or in cooperation with member states. The um, experts uh, as a group would suggest as aspects to take into account the burden of alcohol-related harm at national level, medical and public health stakeholders' views, and the use of a pre-selected criterion for low risk. For example, one in 100 lifetime risk of death, like in Australia, or one in 1,000. There, among the expert panel, there was clear tendency to prefer the 1 in 100 risk level over the more cautious 1 in 1,000 risk level. This is my last slide. Uh, it shows how the current low-risk drinking uh, definitions in a few countries look like in the light of a, a criterion of uh, low risk of 1 in 100 deaths or 1 in 1,000. So if you look at Finland, for instance, we have at the moment, moment the guideline that for men not to drink more than 20 grams on average per day, and for women it's 10 grams. That's quite close to the level of 1 in 100 risk. But if we were to go for the more cautious, 1 in 1,000 level, then we would need to revise our low-risk drinking uh, guideline down, downwards a little bit. So the experts uh, were a little bit divided about whether the level of low risk defined as, as 1 in 1,000 could be uh, just simply chosen like that following the Australian, uh, Australian example, or whether this issue should be placed in the hands of an international body. But for the overall approach, there was clear support. And uh, at this point, I thank you for your attention. Uh, the floor is open uh, for the question that I can imagine uh, you would like to. Peter. I, I think the issue of older people is getting to be very interesting because the general approach is one that you've talked about of, of talking about frailty, comorbidity, falls, all that kind of stuff. Um, however, if you take into account the, the, the acute harms, they are much less for older people than for, for younger people. Um, and the, so I, I, I think I'm right, and I, I'll, I'll need to go back through the papers, that, that actually for, if you're going to make age-specific guidelines, then probably the science leads you to, to having higher uh, limits for older people than for younger people because of this much lower risk of, of, of acute harm you know, in a drinking episode. So it's, I guess I'm just pointing out, it seems interesting that intuitively people seem to think that the 
guidelines ought to be lower for older people. But I, I think it may be that the science, maybe some people know more than me on this, that the science actually points to a, 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 a higher, low risk level of consumption for older people. That may be the case, but on the other hand, we do not have very much information on drinking habits of older people, because in the population surveys, the age, age range stops at around 65 or something like that. And nowadays we have people who are around 80 and still drinking, and people who are 90 and still going strong, and actually we have very little information on them. But there is, at the moment, there is, there is acute need for guidelines on, on how, what to do with older people's drinking. So, for instance, in Finland, we before we used a, a guideline taken from the American Association of Geriatrists. Is that the way to pronounce it? Well, old people specialists. That was to limit drinking to one or two drinks um, um, per day, I think. But uh, they have uh, they have uh, given up that recommendation, and there is no there is no uh, um, there is no um, appropriate source for that kind of recommendation any longer available. So the current guideline in Finland focuses on the specific risks related to the use of medication and uh, and the the changes in the metabolism and so forth, and and those are very very individual things, so, the, so the, I think the main message for older people should be that they should really stop and, and think uh, carefully about their situation, preferably together with a health professional who knows about these things. More question? We have... Uh, we have uh, about 15 minutes before the lunch break for discussion. Mm. Nobody wants to discuss. Kit. She wants to discuss usually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's because <clears throat> I was very happy to see uh, that there was uh, such a big agreement uh, among the experts uh, on a lot of things uh, in this uh, low risk Delphi uh, study. So I, I'm uh, very optimistic concerning that uh, it would be possible for an expert group uh, con consisting of people from the WHO or e EU or what do I know, uh, to, to make a proposal about uh, what can we draw from the Delphi study? What do we agree upon mostly? And then uh, try to make a debate uh, uh, in the member states about uh, uh, this proposal. Uh, I, I think it would be nice just to push this uh, process, not to wait for more research and so on and so forth. I think we are in a, a situation where it would be nice for most member states that they have had a European backing for the recommendation to the, the, the people. And of course, we couldn't just have one low-risk drinking guideline. We, we had to have a lot of messages, uh, which is also uh, summarized in your presentation. Yeah. yeah, I think that you are quite right there. What is needed is not just uh, uh, a number of uh, drinks or an amount of grams that you should drink or that you are allowed to drink, but we need multi-component messages. And, uh, and uh, I think that it's about what we are intending to do in this work package, that we use the results of the Delphi survey and the feedback we get from you and from others uh, in the joint action to present our um, conclusions and our recommendations on, on the points on which we agree and on the points that we recommend others to agree and it's quite quite um, possible for individual member states to take this work we have done and take the work that has been done in the UK for instance into account when they come to the point where they want to revise their guidelines and of course it would be very nice if uh, another expert group would be set up to discuss for instance whether to go for the one in a 100 or one in 1000 level 
but that was not a task for this um, joint action and also we we were not mandated to set the number of drinks or grams we are a mixed group we are not uh, we are not all similar specialists so we are trying to move forward the discussion han I just like to push it a little bit more because I think that you know we've, this whole issue has been discussed many years, you know, in one form or another. I think the I think this this project has I'm not involved in it, but I think it has done great work. Uh, and I think to me, just reading the reports about what what you found from the Delphi uh, aspect of it, is that I think there it wouldn't be difficult to get consensus about the one in a hundred and one in a thousand. And, but at the end of the day, the biggest challenge is the standard drink. What does that mean? Uh, and it's not just a cultural thing. I mean, Peter is talking about, you know, the UK has the one gram. We have one standard drink uh, country beside them. And it goes back for more than a hundred years. And it's about how we served the, a standard drink of whiskey. And, and so it's not a, a point of actually saying, okay, we can change that. That f fundamentally is an extremely difficult thing to do because it means that either the UK has to serve more whiskey in their measure or we have to serve less. Now, I'm only taking those two Vodka countries. <laughs> you're whiskey drinkers, or at least you're producing a lot of it. So I think that that, that perhaps is, is a big challenge. But I think if we could get consensus even on getting grams, and then if we have grams, uh, the total grams on, on a container, then each country can interpret that differently. But I think if we could get one or two key common issues or markers across all the EU, then I think we could really progress the signs into not just the, the, the communication mes messages which you mentioned, which are absolutely critical, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day more important than everything. But when it comes down to it, uh, politicians, health, health specialists need to have some numbers, and I think we have to take that into consideration. Yeah, I, I quite agree that uh, there is a lot of agreement among the specialists. I was actually astonished to see that they were so almost unanimous on some points, almost, I'm saying, because there are always those who have a different point of view. And, uh, and uh, there was, on some points, very lit little differences in the views presented in the first and second round of the Delphi survey, which kind of maybe sends the message that the agreement is, is in place and it is very strong, that there is a lot of for us to go forward. And uh, it also seems that the standard drink issue is extremely difficult. Um, um, the standard drink, by definition, is not the same as the serving measure. And that's how it has been for a long time. When I was preparing my presentation for our previous meeting, I found um, a kind of an illustration that came from Germany from the 1910 or 1920s, where it was about work safety instructions where they tried to explain what kind of German servings contain 10 grams of alcohol. So this issue has been a challenge for at least a hundred years already. But the, the grams might help and there is support from the expert panel for using the grams on the package. But I frankly think that this is an area where proper consumer research would be needed with focus groups and, 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 and mock bottles and whatnot, and maybe some sort of exercise in monitoring your consumption using different instruments to figure out how we can help consumers. Because the, the point is that if there are people who want to monitor their drinking, they, they need to have a practical tool for, to, for doing that. Mm. May I have, this is my opinion. Uh, probably it has much more impact to see the number of calories that are in, into a bottle than uh, the quantity of alcohol that, uh, that is in. Because people should be much more interested in uh, not gaining weight 
uh, by mean drinking. It, it's, of course, uh, uh, it could be a joke, but uh, there are some experiences. Also, Eurocare demonstrated something also in the last uh, European conference on alcohol by mean uh, a video on this, an experience that has been done. And probably this can contribute also as a cross-cutting team towards uh, the, you know, the fight to obesity and uh, to make also available some uh, common views uh, that uh, also in the Commission are arising about uh, the fight to the different risk factors and to make uh, alcohol alive also in the other fields. So probably uh, uh, there are people who should not mm, passionate about the, the quantity of grams of alcohol, but probably are much more keen to understand how many calories there are into a glass probably could be also influence this, the, the behavior of consumers, because about consumers we are, we are speaking of. There is an, one more question there. Um, yeah, I have a question uh, related more to the communication part uh, that you mentioned. Um, I'm interested or curious, uh, what do you know, uh, what proportion of the population uh, is aware of current uh, national drinking guidelines? And if you have in, any information of uh, the features of this uh, group, so whether they're old, young, uh, male, female, heavy drinkers, not heavy drinkers, etc., uh, is there any information out there? Well, the, um, I think that it has, the awareness has been researched in the United Kingdom, and uh, Denmark has researched that because Denmark has been disseminating these guidelines for several decades. And there may be uh, information from some other countries as well. But um, I could reply regarding my own country, Finland. I was going to maybe say this in the presentation I have in the afternoon. But in Finland, we have been, we have been um, since the 1990s, I think, or maybe even mid-80s, we have been disseminating information about high-risk levels of drinking. And then in the 2000s, a low-risk uh, guideline was issued as well. But that one has never been properly disseminated in Finland. So awareness of the low-risk guideline in Finland is minimal. I, I would assume that it's close to 95, 99%. Few people know about that. And that's our own fault. We have not been disseminating information about that. We have been focusing on the high risk level. Doris. So not disseminating things we have, uh, of course, uh, it, it cannot uh, inform people who should be informed about it. But I think we also have another p uh, communication problem on the guidelines, as you already uh, mentioned. And um, <coughs> we, normally we easily reach those people who do not really n need the guidelines. But we have difficulties um, to reach those people, for example, the binge drinking young people, uh, and they are not really, they, they do not really like uh, all our guidelines and our, all our advice because they decided already they would like to ignore some things, the adults or whatever um, people are telling about, are speaking about. So we must find a way uh, also to reach especially those um, parts of our population who are really in danger to drink too much. Mm. Yeah, I think you are quite right there. The high-risk uh, groups need a different approach than the um, general population and the regular alcohol consumers. But the point is with the low-risk guidelines that everybody needs to be informed about the risks related to drinking about, and about how to reduce those risks. Keith. Um, <clears throat> yes, we have been uh, had these uh, guidelines uh, since uh, 1990 and we started out with high risk drinking guidelines and then in 2007 we changed them to low risk drinking guidelines and as a matter of fact we don't use the high risk drinking guidelines uh, uh, 
in the population anymore. It's meant uh, for the professionals to know that if people are drinking at that level, they have to intervene. So uh, we have had a communication um, problem because we have shifted the guidelines. Uh, but uh, even though we can see that uh, around 60% of the population know about the guidelines, but that is because we have yearly mm. campaigns. We can see that the knowledge is dropping before the campaign and raising again after the campaign. So you have to have yearly campaigns, uh, and that is... Uh, because of many other reasons, also very, very important, because you can communicate not just uh, the guidelines, but also the cancer risk or the binge drink risk or any other things when you are making these campaigns. And so they're not that expensive. No comment, Mark. <laughs> no, I quite agree. I'm <laughs> okay. impressed with the, the, the persistent work in Denmark, because that's the point that campaigns are such are a weak instrument. But if you keep doing them, if you keep saying the same thing all over and over again, then it might make a difference. And I think that the, bread, the Danish approach has been brilliant because the core message stays the same. But each year there can be a different group that's targeted. Sometimes it's men, sometimes it's parents, sometimes it's maybe women, younger, older, so forth. So there is a little bit variation, but the core message has been all the time the same. The standard drinks and the, and the guidelines, the official guidelines from the health authorities. And um, you can hear your, your, the work you have done to, to monitor the effects shows that it, it can have an effect in terms of awareness and, and Well, I would just say that uh, you can see that the consumption has fallen uh, from uh, 96 uh, to 2012 with 25%, almost 25%. Mm. So you could say that uh, disseminating information has been maybe a factor in the shift in attitudes. Thank you. Thank you, Marietta. I think we can uh, close here the, the morning session. We will have uh, one hour uh, of break.